Hey everyone, welcome back to The Leadership Project with your host Mick Spears. Our vision is to inspire all leaders to challenge the status quo. We bring you weekly topics and thought-provoking guests to get you to stop, reflect and think about what it means to be a leader in a modern world. Our aim is to help you become the leader you wish you always had as we learn together and lead together. Please enjoy the show. Hey everyone and welcome back to The Leadership Project. We're greatly honoured to be joined by today by Emil Dobrilovsky and Octavian Pontish. Emil is a pilot, he's a pilot instructor and a pilot examiner. Okay, Octavian is an entrepreneur who is the co-founder of an organization called Qualians. It's a training and consultancy organization and he's a keynote speaker and a best-selling author. I'm really excited to pre- uh, bring you today's interview and the story of how Emil and Octavian met that ended up forming a deep, deep friendship and becoming best-selling authors together as they authored the book Dark Cockpit. The essence of Dark Cockpit is how you can communicate, lead, and be in control at all times, just like an airline pilot or captain is when they're in an aircraft. So great to have you here today, Emil and Octavian. I would like to start with both of you introducing your background individually, and then we'll lead ourselves to the story of how you met. So Emil, I'd like to start with you. Hello, Mick. Thank you for the invitation. You're right. I just celebrated 28 years in the same company. I'm flying for the Romanian national carrier. Uh, I studied there as a co-pilot. Now I'm a flying examiner. And also I'm an examiner for the European Safety Agency. I'm the senior examiner of the Romanian uh, Civil Aviation Authority. I'm checking pilots and I'm flying for my national carrier still in Bucharest. I'm a passionate uh, uh, aviator. I'm a passionate reader and I'm passionate about uh, motorcycling. So in short, that's me. Outstanding, Emil. And uh, thank you so much for being here today. I'm looking forward to hearing your guidance about how pilots communicate and how we as leaders can actually put that into practice in our lives. And Octavian, please uh, introduce your background. Sure. Hello, Mick. Hello, everybody who's uh, listening or watching the discussion. I have, I could say I have three hats. One hat is uh, I'm an entrepreneur. Back in 1999, we started an international training and consulting company, working with large multinational organizations in different countries, helping them build what we call the human side of leadership, of business performance, which is leadership, uh, key business skills, uh, company culture, just as a statistic that just uh, came out. Last year in 2021, it turns out that we delivered workshops to people in 25 different countries across the world. So, uh, of course, the pandemic is bad, but uh, one good thing of it is this online um, uh, connection that really makes the world a small place and we can be together in the same uh, virtual room much more easier than than before. My second hat is um, I'm a trainer and keynote speaker myself. I speak mostly on leadership and work-life balance and productivity, which is a very hot topic now with these changes going on in the way people work, great resignation, the working from home, the gig economy and all these things, which are uh, making uh, big changes in, uh, and, and to some people creating high levels of stress in, in the way we work. And there are ways in which we can um, fully utilize the opportunities that exist. And my third head is I'm an author. I started writing audiobooks. Uh, my first audiobook was in 2008 on time management, then a few other ones on change, on leadership, and on communication skills. And I wrote a, a book on um, work life balance in 2012, which became a bestseller. And uh, I met Emil in 2008. Uh, and uh, uh, the result of that, one of the results is the Dark Cockpit book. And I'm, I'll be glad to go into more details in that. Outstanding. Thank you, Octavian. That's very impressive, the reach that you're achieving there with your organization 
And of course, the topics that you're uh, covering are very much aligned to what we talk about here at the Leadership Project. And if we get a chance later in the interview, I, I think I would like to explore with you your thoughts about the Great Resignation and what is causing that and what we can do as leaders to start addressing that. So I'll park some time at the end for us to come back to that. Sure. Very interesting for us. So we teased the audience before that the two of you had a chance meeting. Who would like to take the lead and tell us just how that happened? Please, Octavia. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell it from the passenger's uh, perspective. So one of our colleagues, I knew that one of our colleagues has a friend who's a, who's a captain at Tarom, and that, that's it. And then one way, one uh, summer of 2008, uh, my family and I were flying on vacation with Tarom. And what was surprising was that um, uh, after we boarded and after we took off, the captain addressed the passengers. Now, I'm sure Mick and everybody who's, listened, who's listening to us, we've been in a situation where the captain says something or tries to say something and you understand nothing. Like it's like they're holding the nose and saying, oh, there's a bad no, and then, yeah. But on that particular flight, we could understand 100% of what he was saying. He had a clear hello, welcome on board. And then he uh, told us what we were going to see on the right hand side, on the left hand side, on our trip to uh, Greece, it was back then. And everything, of course, the flight was smooth. Everything was, was really perfect. So at the end of the flight, I uh, asked the flight attendant to, could you please repeat the name of the captain? I want to make a note. And I want to tell my colleague who knows a pilot to please say thank you to that um, 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 pilot from, from my house. And he said, my, the uh, name of the captain is Emil Dobrovolsky. So I wrote my colleague, say, hey, tell your pilot friend to, to give a, a ciao to a hello or thank you to a certain Captain Emil Dobrovolsky because we flew with him today and the flight was perfect and we could understand everything he was saying. And my colleague replied, hey, my friend's name is Captain Emil Dobrovolsky. So not only I will tell him, but I'll make sure that the two of you meet. So we met a couple of weeks afterwards and then uh, we invited Emil to, um, to visit with our team and to share with us um, how is the aviation, how are things being done there, how does he lead the team. And it was the, the stories he was sharing were fascinating for us. Uh, number one. And number two, they were also useful, meaning we could take something from what he was sharing. This is how we do this in aviation, how we communicate or how we delegate, how we do things. And we were able to apply those things in our team and said, oh, there's, there's something here. Now, we regularly offer uh, speakers to our customers when they organize events. So we said, Emil, would you like to, if we have an invitation, would you like to address? And he said, sure, why, no, why not? And we started with one company the second company, third company. And what was very interesting is that whatever the industry, whether it was pharma, whether it was banking, whether it was something else, uh, the feedback was very good. Same two things. Number one, fascinating. It's interesting because all of us who are flying, we're curious about how things work. And whenever we board a plane, uh, if it's a single aisle and we board and before we make a right to our seat, if the cockpit door is open, Right, we hang around with uh, and look around for two more seconds in the cockpit, and we're fascinated. So it's interesting. And number two, the feedback was, "Oh, this is very useful. This will help me in how we manage things, in how we communicate, in how we lead, in how we do backups to backups." So after a few speeches, I said, "Emil, uh, the stories are great. The principles from aviation are wonderful. You should write a book." Uh, and luckily for me, he said, "Octavian, you did write a book before, and that became a bestseller." Why don't we write this book together? So that this was in um, summer of 2018 or autumn of 2018. By the next spring, uh, the book was done. Uh, we wrote it together. Each chapter is written by uh, both of us. Each chapter has insights from aviation, whether it's principles, whether it's here's a little bit of history or, each, or stories from aviation. And then each chapter has links to the lives of a new leader, for instance. How can you? motivate your team? How can you um, get everyone aligned so that you achieve the results that you want to achieve? Uh, how do you communicate things like that? And uh, the book came out uh, towards the end of 2019 in Romania, in Romanian. It was a big hit. Um, uh, thousands of copies got sold within a few weeks or months. And then the pandemic hit. So the kind of slowed down a little bit, but the feedback was very good. And people kept telling us, you have to take this message internationally because the world of aviation is a global one. 
and the the needs of leaders today uh, are are bigger than ever. So, which is what we did. So in the summer of 2021, uh, we launched the book in English. We had it done nicely with a very good translation. Work with an American publishing company. Everything looks is great about the book, and we're glad that we're receiving great feedback from around the world um, about the book. And by the way, um, very different kinds of people are buying the book. Of course, uh, leaders are buying it so that they can improve. But the companies also buy it as gift for their employees. They buy it as gift for their customers. People buy it for their kids. If they have a teenage kid or older, here's a book that will guide you through your high school or university years so that you can make good decisions. We have young um, professionals buying the book for their parents. We have a, a very narrow, com- narrow target group, but an important target group is um, there are some people who are af- afraid of flying. And we have feedback that people, after having read the book, uh, their fear of flying decreased a little bit because they, what, what they realized in the book is uh, so many nets, so many safety nets are there. Uh, everything is done not by the ear, not keeping fingers crossed by their checks and checks and everything is checked two times, three times, five times, and there's a system for everything. And people say, oh, okay, so it's, it's not just ah, we fly. No, it's, it's make sure, people make sure that it's done well. So we're glad that people are flying more because of uh, also uh, finding insights from the book. So this is kind of uh, in a nutshell. That's really interesting. And Mick, uh, yes, please. Uh, allow, uh, please, just Amir, go ahead. Short glimpse and how we wrote the book. It's actually, the, the book is uh, based on my story, what happened to me along my career, flying or teaching or uh, checking people, the pilots, professional pilots in the simulator, in the full fly simulators. And... Based on that, the, the good eye of Octavian, who's seeing a story and he can pull out more strings out of it and more uh, thoughts about it, more lessons. Let me tell you a short example. He told me once, he said, you know, you realize that every time you go to fly, when you do the briefing with your crew, maybe there are five people there or maybe there are 14 people there. You have a new crew every day, so you have to present yourself in front of them as a leader. So you have, you have a, the capacity of showing yourself not as a captain or as a boss, but as a leader in front of a different crew every day. So this is the kind of interaction we had when we wrote the book. So my stories, yeah, they are fascinating. I have lots of lessons to share because the professionals in every domain, they have the same challenges. They have to, uh, to, to deal with the same outcome, uh, miscommunication, uh, poor leadership. So they have to know better how to do. Every, every one of us, even now in our personal lives, we have to deal with some uh, crisis from time to time. So who's better to, uh, for crisis management than the professional pilot? So I have these stories, but Octavian has a good eye of seeing new uh, facets, new angles of to, uh, to attack a problem and to pull out new ideas, new lessons, you know. Thank you, Emil. And uh, I can see how this is a beautiful marriage, if you like, of a chance meeting leading to a deep friendship and then the writing of this book together in a way that is a translation. It's a translation from one world into another world of what lessons we can take away from that. And this very much resonates with us at the Leadership Project, just to share something with the two of you. This is what we look for. We look for people that come from different walks of life, different domains, to gather that diversity of thought, to see what we can learn from these different domains and disciplines and apply them in applied leadership. So one of my favorite interviews, and I shouldn't have favorites, but I do. One of my favorite interviews has been episode 14 with Don Campbell. And Don is a sculptor. He's a 71-year-old sculptor from the artistic world. And we interviewed him with the view about creativity. What can we learn from the artistic world that we can bring into our teams to unlock creativity. And what evolved was this wonderful conversation about deep listening and about listening with an open mind, with an open heart and with an open will to really reconsider a new world. 
So we love this kind of concept of taking something from one world and seeing how we can translate it into another world. So I'm ready to explore that with you today. And Emil, one thing that you did mention, I'm definitely going to come back to this shortly in the interview, is about the fact that the cabin crew and the air crew on that flight are a different team every day. And I've got a specific question I want to come to on that one. Let's start with, and Emil, I think you are best placed to answer this one. What do you mean by dark cockpit? I know that uh, the sound of it uh, or uh, the concept is uh, not common, but in aviation is a good thing. It's an aviation concept when all the lights in the cockpit, in your cockpit as a person or as a human being, should be dark. No alerts, no white lights, meaning that some systems are off. And how many times we have something off around us, maybe a partner, maybe a business partner. But you know that it's in off because you're just looking overhead panel on your controls. On a dark cockpit, you see immediately the white light minutes. Or if you have a caution, it's an amber light, and it's uh, something like a tooth pain or something which bothers you. You can continue doing your thing, but you know it's there. Maybe your um, competency is not at the level you should be because you have these alerts all the time. So you don't have to, as a pilot, I don't have to address a, a caution light, but I, I know it's there. You can postpone it for a, a later when you have more time uh, in the book. We, we suggest that you address the problem as they appear. Otherwise, they can gather there and you have lots of lights on your overhead panel. And of course, your performance is low. Um, your life becomes more complicated. Your professional life, your personal life is more complicated when you have a Christmas cockpit, which is the opposite of dark cockpit. And one more thing, when you have a dark cockpit, it's not given to you by someone. That means that you're operating well that you are doing the things that are supposed to, that you're following the procedures, you're not exceeding any limits, so you're, fi- like you're flying or you are performing well. It's a lot of work, not lots of knowledge, lots of discipline to have a dark cockpit. So I'm inviting our writers and your, our listeners to think about their cockpit, to think if they are in dark cockpit or not, and if they are not, what they were doing well when they were in dark cockpit and to to imagine their life or their control their cockpit to be in um, to manage it in such a way that obtain dark cockpit every time they they are in pursuit of uh, i don't know to do something a project Um, maybe it's a personal project maybe it's something uh, in your professional life but imagine what you were doing well when you were in dark cockpit Yeah, really interesting, uh, Emil, and I want to unpack that a little bit further and then share a reflection about that and come to you, Octavian, uh, for your views about the extrapolation. So first of all, coming back to what Octavian said a a while back, I do the same thing. When I board a plane, I always have a little glance to the left and see if I can see the cockpit and everything. I think a lot of people do this. So, So when you do that, it's quite often that you'll get on board and you'll have a look to the left and the, the pilots will be going through pre-flight checks, et cetera, et cetera. And the cockpit can look like a Christmas tree at that point with lights on everywhere, et cetera, et cetera, which is a completely normal thing at that point. What Emil is then saying is that when you're in steady flight and everything's going well, you want all of those lights essentially off, no warning lights, no alarms, et cetera, et cetera. And what I heard is two things. The first thing I heard is that's not by any kind of accident. That's through disciplined control and and approaches to maintain that dark cockpit state. And the second thing I heard that was very powerful there, Emil, is that when you do start having any kind of illumination, whether it's an advisory through to a warning through to something more serious, that you need to address them and address them one at a time as they come up. Otherwise, there's going to be a compounding effect. And before you know it, you're in complete overload in terms of sensory and everything that's going on around you. So Octavian, hopefully my interpretation's good. 
how do you translate that into the business world, that lesson, when you're with your clients? Yeah. So um, in a way, you could say dark cockpit is the opposite of being overwhelmed with tasks and with stimuli of all kind. Uh, this can happen on a physical level to all of us, uh, but even worse is when this happen when this happen on happens on a mental level. So uh, in a cockpit, yeah, there are lots of indicators or button, but they're not lit. When there are when there is light to them, then you need to do something. But otherwise, it's not there. What would be the equivalent of that in a physical copy? Your desk, your computer, for instance. Many people, when they work, they have a number of windows open. They've got the emails, bing, 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 bing. They have the phone next to the, uh, which is messages coming there. Maybe they have some notes. Maybe they left a paper on the desk as a reminder that they have to do something about a third issue. Uh, and which is uh, probably aggravates things if they're working from home, maybe they are in the kitchen, there's some soup cooking or the child is doing something. Now, obviously, that is too much. And in aviation, everything is optimized. They don't want to overwhelm the crew. They don't want to over because then, then that's not good for anybody. So they take away things. Now, in our home, in our home office, work office, wherever that is, it is us who need to clean things up around us. Don't open too many uh, windows, switch off your mobile, or at least turn it on silent, put it in a different room. If you want to really focus on something for one hour or 30 minutes, keep your desk tidy and things like that. This is on a physical level. On a mental level, there are things in our mind. I need to have a delicate discussion with that person. I need to do this. I need to do that. make a note of them. And if, if there's something that um, really troubling you, like you really have to have a delicate discussion with somebody in your team because they've done something wrong or because they are aggressive to their colleagues. Don't postpone it. Do it right away. Because if you postpone it, nothing good will come out of it. Yeah, maybe they'll be better. No, they won't be better. They'll be more aggressive and the people in the team will see that nothing is being done. So the best will leave and things like that. So don't, if you have stuff that is on your mind, address it right away. Or at least if you cannot address it entirely, at least do the first step. You might say, oh, I have to talk to my own boss about that. Fine. Send an email to schedule a call with your boss for next Tuesday at 2 p.m. or whenever that is. If you've done that, you know, okay, there's nothing else I need to do that. So it's the opposite of being overwhelmed. This is a term from aviation. It's common that two pilots will say, how was your flight today from Paris to, oh, it was dark cockpit all the way. That's a good thing. Now, uh, when we wrote the book, we did not start with the title. We said, let's focus on the content. Let's make sure the content's good. And the title will come later. And we had, a, we had two titles on the shortlist. One was Dark Cockpit. The other one was, this is your captain speaking. Be speaking meaning that, hey, it's less um, we like Dark Cockpit best. Uh, and we also did not want to uh, sound as, come across as arrogant. Now, you shut up now because it's your captain speaking. So we like Dark Cockpit. And it has a good, uh, it has a good sense to it. And the uh, what can leaders do? If you know you need to get something to sum, to sum it all up, do something about it. Don't, don't postpone it. Don't say it's Friday, I'll deal with it on Monday, because we know it will be on your mind the entire weekend. Then you won't be able to enjoy whatever you want to do in the weekend, reading, family, kids, whatever, because you know you have this delicate stuff to do. Online. So do and as a general rule, don't overwhelm your work environment, your phone with apps, notifications like that, because that's, that's not good. These are small things, but small, one small thing, thing here and there can lead to a busy day. And sometimes people look at their watches. Oh, my God, it's 3 p.m. already. Where did the day fly? Well, it flew because of it, 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 it got lost, actually, in all kinds of details. And if you think about it, there, there were two major things I wanted to get done today, and none of them is done by 3 p.m. And that's not good. Yeah, so if I may add one, please, Emil. Yeah. Make, um, uh, the way we wrote the book, we, we understand that there's a huge know-how in aviation. We can borrow to other domains, but we never, in the book, we were thinking of giving lessons to someone or to look down on someone. Look, if you don't do, if you don't do like this, you're doomed. If you don't do like this, you're not a good leader. If you don't do like this, you cannot communicate well. No, what we did is that we picked some of our, some of my experience in flying or some of the lessons from aviation, because they're not all happened to me. Uh, fortunately, <laughs> you'll see the greatest uh, uh, accident in modern aviation. But we took 
the lessons out of there and we showed to our readers how the things were done then and how the things are done now. So what we learned from that unfortunate event or what we learned from that incident, what we learned from miscommunication, and this is the way the book is written. We don't look down on nobody. So we don't pretend to be someone, a professor, we look uh, down on our students and to, to, to discipline them. It's a leader's job to bring clarity to the team, right? So you could say dark cockpit and aviation is about managing complexity. It's a leader's role. It's, it's acceptable if there's a new employee just uh, got employed here two weeks ago, there's a mess in his head because he doesn't know. That's fine. That's okay. But if there's chaos in the leader's mind, that's not good for anybody. So um, it's about managing complexity, simplifying what you can and organizing the rest. Mm. It's a powerful message, uh, both of you. And uh, rest assured, I've read the book twice now and it doesn't come across as being preaching or looking down on anyone. It, it comes across exactly as this here. Here are some thoughts from the aviation industry and how you might apply them in your industry or your domain. So don't be concerned about that. And for people at home, I strongly encourage you to get a copy. It's a very good read and it really makes sense when you start applying some of these concepts. The two powerful takeaways, to summarize them here, that concept, if, if you haven't tried this before, the concepts of time blocking and really focusing your, your time without distractions and immersing yourself into tasks and into activities, the productivity that comes from that, the clarity that comes from that is amazing. You're probably not surprised to hear that a part of my job is actually social media. I'll, I'll give that as an example. But I don't sit there with social media on all day. If, you, if I pulled up my schedule and showed it to you now, I have an hour every day that's dedicated to responding to people's comments, to making my own comments on other people's posts, etc. So I schedule one hour a day on social media. And then for the other 23 hours a day, notifications are off there, separated. I would never write my book, for example. I would never have finished it if I allowed myself to get uh, distracted like that. Then the other part about if there is something going on in your team or in your workplace, ignoring it, if it's a problem, it only snowballs. It only gets worse if you do not address it. And, and part of what Emil and Octavian are sharing with us, it's also going to play on your mind until you have addressed it. So it's, it's in your own interest to declutter your mind by just nipping it in the bud and making sure that you do address it. So Emil, I think this is a good question for you. The next topic I'd like to discuss is in the book, you use the term communicate unequivocally. What does that mean to you? I know that in every domain, when something goes, something goes wrong, everybody will blame first the communication. We didn't communicate well. We didn't pass the message well. The message was not, was not received. And, but in aviation, for us, it's the paramount informa- uh, import- importance. Why? Because we are just two people in a cockpit, in a dark cockpit, facing forward, not seeing each other to validate a message. We, had, we have headsets on our ears. We can hear the crisscross of communication, and there are lots of noise in those helmets. You know, So we are not seeing each other. We cannot uh, validate the message with body language. And of course, from some landmarks, we have some standard communication. We have some standard calls to pass a message. And if something goes wrong, we catch up immediately. Why? Because we have a landmark when somebody has to do something to say something first, a standard call, and the other one to confirm it. But otherwise, that's, it's such a complex environment. It's so complicated that the standard calls, they don't cover everything. And every time I'm training pilots, I'm telling them that the pilots are expert communicators. They, they learn, they exercise, they practice the communication in such a way that the message goes through at the right time and at the right moment to, to solve a problem. Because the, the, the communicates, the word is just the beginning of an action. 
if you just stay there silent will, and you see something and you say nothing, nothing will happen. Every time when you say something, a standard call or a message, this will be the trigger for an action. Maybe it's a memory item, maybe it's a line from, a, uh, from a, uh, the checklist, maybe it's an action, but it's initiated by the, this call. Without this call, without the words, the cockpit will be impossible to imagine. The problems, because we are talking here not just from the, from the normal uh, operation in a cockpit, we have to think about abnormal or emergency situations. So we have to anticipate all of those and we have to communicate well, just, not just between us, between us, between the cabin crew and us, between us and air traffic controller. So we have to, to manage this communication in such a way that the message will go through immediately, hits the right uh, ear, and uh, it's a trigger to, to, for an action. Without it, uh, I cannot imagine the, the flying a cockpit these days. So this is a practice. You can read about it. But if you don't practice it, if you don't really communicate in the right way, in personal way, because it, uh, in a cockpit, the uh, communication is, in, is impersonal. When I'm saying a call, let's say, uh, if a co-pilot, the other day, I had a co-pilot. She, was, she is 28, and she's the first job in aviation. And she passed me a message. The way she thought is better. She, she yelled at me, landing gear down. And when I was lowering the gear, uh, doing what she said because she was flying, I realized that second that I was so focused on other things in the cockpit, in, a, in the crowd, uh, crowdly environment, that she called me twice before. So she reached me, yelling at me, landing gear down. So I lowered the gear, and then she was afraid of, the, of my feedback. I said, look, my feedback is a positive one because in a cockpit, we are, we are aiming to solve the problems. We are not looking for, the, for guilty persons or we're not blaming each other. You find this way, which was a good way, by the way, because you, uh, you startled me with this. And I was paying attention to you because you already told me twice. And she said, yeah, I didn't know what to do. So the, it, this was a good thing. This is a way to communicate in a cockpit, to look forward, to solve the problems, uh, and pass the message. This is the, the simple lesson. Just pass the message. So thank you, Emil, for sharing what that means to you. The things I want to explore are as follows. The first one, how much of that, that ability for air crew to communicate with each other with such clarity, how much of that do you think relates to having a common lexicon? Uh, not much, actually. It's not much. If you ask a crowd, if you have a hundred people in front of you and you ask them who communicates well, you'll just see a few hands raise, right, raising, you know? They, they think about themselves that they don't communicate well. But by training, uh, using, we have a common language, actually. We, have, we speak in English. All the, con- all the commands, all the acknowledgements are in English, in aviation. It's the modern aviation world, is the modern aviation language. So we have a common language, but we come from different countries with different backgrounds, different educations. And sometimes things that somebody said, they're not the same. You're, if you are from, I don't know, from South, uh, uh, if you are from Africa, if you say something, maybe uh, you think that I'll be offended and you have to trim your words. But in aviation, we don't do that. We speak frankly, directly. Why? It's simple. Communication is not, it's impersonal. It's not about you and me. It's about uh, solving the problem. It's about going through a process of doing another procedure. It's as simple as that. So as quick as people realize that, that when I'm saying to a young co- uh, cap- the captain or to a young first officer, uh, speed, I'm not saying, you come on, you're stupid. You're not keeping the speed you said you're keeping. No, I'm just, I'm, I'm, it's a trigger for him or her to adjust the speed. You know what I mean? If somebody tell me, tells me glide slope, that means that I'm, I'm not keeping the glide slope for landing. I'm above the glide half a point. I'm below the glide half a point. So this is a feedback I will simply thank for because at the end, my project, my flight is better when I'm accepting feedback. Why? Again, 
the communication is impersonal. It's not about me or him or her. It's just about the cockpit, the uh, procedures, and the step of the flight. Yeah, thanks, Emil. That's a that's a good explanation. And the second part I wanted to explore, and then we'll come to Octavian for the translation into the business world. I picked up in the book that a big part of it was confirmation of understanding. So when in that scenario that you're talking about before about the landing gear, that when the person is communicating, there's also an acknowledgement that the communication were received and a confirmation that the communication was understood. Uh, is that also something that you think happens in the cockpit? Yeah, why? It's, it's so, uh, it's, we have a word. It's not, I know, it's not uh, comfortable when I. So every time, if you look at the uh, TV show or you read about it, it's always starting with a bad communication. And that ev- uh, evolved to a new communication concept. When, when somebody says something, the other has to, com- to comply and repeat. When the air traffic controllers instruct me to turn right 20 degrees, I don't just say yes or I will. Meaning what? How many degrees? Left or right? So the controller will, not, will be confused. Yes, what? He understands to, start to turn right 20 degrees. He will comply. Now, when? When the pilot will just answer, turning right 20 degrees. And in some parts, when there are no digits, of course, you can just say, we'll go, we'll comply. When there are digits, degrees, uh, speeds, uh, um, levels, numbers in general, you have to repeat the entire message. So... I'm, I'm amused sometimes when people are new in aviation that they are just answering yes to your in the, in the cockpit because in the cockpit we are not talking to each other, we communicate to each other. When I say uh, this is an off, I'm expecting to him to say or her to say check. Why? Because otherwise I'll be just alone there pressing buttons. You know, so every time, every maneuver in the cockpit should be confirmed by the other pilot with a small, with, with a, just a word, check. Not just say check looking on the window the other side, but look at the right or the, the maneuver and then saying check. And you train that in the fly full fly simulator. I'm, I'm not lowering it. and uh, the, the co pilots unexperienced at the beginning of their careers will just say a down three green, not checking. Why? Because they said down, landing gear down so many times. Now it's not down. So it's not just saying. But checking first, and then uh, confirm the the maneuver. So it's a it's a like a loop. It's not longer than five maneuvers sometimes, or three maneuvers nowadays because the the aircraft are more evolved. There are more automation in place. So just three a loop of three things you have to look before checking or acknowledging. But Octavian, it's better on doing this because he translates this into business. So please, Octavian. Yeah, so thank, thanks, Emil. Uh, so, so Octavian, uh, just to feed that to you for a moment, the business world is full of examples of where two parties walk away from a meeting, both thinking that they completely understood what just happened, and then you find out later that there wasn't a common understanding of the outcome of that meeting. Tell me how you translate what Emil is bringing to the table here with, with your people that you help? Oh, sure. Many, many examples. So uh, just linking to aviation, uh, Emil said that whenever there's a message, turn le- when the tower says turn right 30 degrees, the pilot automatically responds, uh, understood, turning right. If we were watching a movie and we would see the plane from outside and we would hear the tower saying turning right 30 degrees and we would hear nothing from the cockpit, we would automatically assume, oh my God, something's wrong, right? Because why? Because otherwise they would have repeated. So we are so accustomed to this happening in aviation. Still, here's what happens in companies. There's a meeting and the boss presents something and slides and whether it's virtual or in a meeting room, speaks for 15, 20 minutes, the strategy, the casts a vision, whatever, and concludes with, 
Okay, so this is the plan. Uh, any questions? No questions? Great. Have a great week ahead. Now, that's a very poor way to uh, close a meeting, right? Because exactly like you said, Mick, you don't know who understood what. Now, ideally, the ideal fee, so there has to be a feedback. Ideally, the feedback is the repeat of the message. This happens in aviation because the stakes are so high, right? Uh, it's turn right 30 degrees. They don't say, yeah, sure. No, this it repeats it. Because if I understood left 30 degrees, I might hit something or something. In business, you can't always repeat the entire message. What are we going to do now? Ask all the, all the 10 people in the room to say the whole presentation that they've heard for 20 minutes each? No. But what something you can do as a leader is, fine, friends, uh, if there are no questions, let's just go around. I'm going to ask each of you to say just one thing that you'll do this week as a result of this presentation, for instance. And then when you hear, they say, where you hear them say things, that's good to for many reasons. Number one, what they say shows me or not that they understood what I was presenting. Uh, number two, they say it. So they, the message is even more clear in they've heard it once, they've said it the second time, so it's clear. Number three, their peers heard them, right? So you said you would make 10 phone calls or you would said you would fix the accounting issue, whatever. We all heard you. So in a week from now, when we meet, of course, we won't criticize you, but you will know that we knew that you had to fix this. So that's one extra stimuli for you to get things done. So one, one message is don't end with any questions. No, okay, see you soon. But ask them to say something. If you have a one-on-one -on -one with somebody, you want to delegate something to them, uh, a task, a challenge, a project, uh, ask them to do the summary in writing. For instance, you can say, Okay, now, uh, if everything's fine, could you please send me a five-bullet summary of what we discussed? Don't you send the summary because you said the initial message by voice. It's still from you. In written, it's double from you, zero from the other person. You said it once, you get their feedback if you ask them to, okay, could you please summarize it in an email to me? What are the things you're going to do? And again, you have it in writing. I have it from you. It's a summary. It's good. Um, number three. Uh, don't use initially too much email. So use voice because when you voice, we all know this, you have the tone of voice, the stuff. Email as a kind of a confirmation, that's good. But if you initially send an email, that's not good enough. And there's a, there's a famous phrase, it's used as an exercise in various countries. Maybe some of our listeners will recognize it. It's just one line of text. And depending on where you put the emphasis, it means different things. I said, she didn't steal the money, right? I said she didn't steal the money. I said she didn't steal the money. I said she didn't steal, not that she, I said, I said she didn't steal the money, but whatever. So the, 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 the message changes a little bit, right? Depending on where you place the emphasis. Now, what does it mean? It means that if I send an email to my, and this is just one sentence, right? Just one line. If I, as a leader, send a message to my 50 people or 100 or whatever, which is two screens long, explaining what I mean. Imagine the different ways in which things can be understood. No team of PR is good enough to craft that message to make sure that all the unwanted messages are taken away from that. So um, uh, do whatever you have a meeting, have a if it's just information, if it's the uh, quarterly report, how much we sold, whatever, yeah, send that as a PDS, no worries. But if there's some change going on, if your company was hit and you need to pivot, or if you have a proactive change of strategy, don't do it on, uh, on email because it's too dry. People will understand. So uh, one of the, to sum it all up, what is very bad for business uh, is the absence of communication. When something happens, people have their own interpretations of it. Some of those interpretations might be good, some might be bad. Uh, but many of them will be off what is the situation. For instance, in many companies, they just advertise a new job. We're recruiting for a new HR manager, for instance. If, they, if people just see the announcement, what does it mean? What's wrong with our one? It's not good enough. She's not good enough. Want another one? Who are, why not from the inside? Why from outside? 100 questions that can be avoided by saying, hey, friends, dear team, yes, um, um, uh, Mary, our head of HR, uh, will head the new division as of the 1st of July. 
I want to have somebody from with outside to replace her to them. And that's, and that solves it. So stay, try to avoid the absence of communication. In aviation, whatever happens, there's a message, there's an exchange of messages about that right away. If they hear a noise in the cockpit that seems to be coming from the back, from the back of the plane, in the next 30 seconds, they're on the phone with the flight attendant from the back of the plane. So it's nothing in business. There are many stimuli going on. Our new competitor launched, our competitor launched a new product. There's no reaction on our internal forums for 24 hours. People will interpret different things. We didn't know. We don't know how to counteract. We don't know this. Uh, even if some people might know, maybe uh, three or four people are already discussing, but the other 500 don't know nothing, and that leaves space for interpretation. Thanks, Octavian, and lots of things to take away there. So making sure that your message has been heard, making sure that it's been understood, uh, making sure that the person is taking some ownership and accountability of the message, which is you know, getting them to summarize back. Really powerful technique and fully agree with you on whether it be emails or even SMS or WhatsApp messages anything that's not uh, picking up that tone and intent and also is not a persistent form of communication. So if it's, if it's sent in, uh, in uh, serial and then someone interprets it in their own time, you've lost control of the ability to pick up anything and, and to clarify, etc. R- really powerful. And thank you for summarizing that. The final one I want to explore with you both And Emil, you touched on this early on, and I promise that I come back to it. Your cabin crew and your air crew, that it could be a different team every day. In our world, I'll say, uh, collectively, Octavian and I, we talk a lot about high performance teams and that you need to go through different stages of development, you know, forming storming, norming, performing, you know, all of these things. You've got the Drexler Sibbett team performance model and bringing a team together over time, getting them to know each other, getting them to trust each other. How do you do that in an aviation world where you turn up one day and your crew is completely different to the day before? Sometimes when the uh, airliners are big, you have thousands maybe Oh, dozens of thousands of pilots. So to fly with the same co-pilot again in one year would be something unusual. So every time you meet them in the briefing room, when everybody knows who's the captain, because you have four stripes on your shoulder, everybody knows who's the first officer with three stripes, everybody knows who's the purser. They don't know each other, but they are flying with the same com- we are flying in the same company. We have the um, share the same values in the company. And we know that uh, the stakes are high, that they are doing this just not for fun. We are, in, we are taking a piece of metal, this tube with wings and empty seats with passengers now in it to animate them to come to life, this, this piece of metal just with us inside. And one more, we know that when we sh- close the door, we shut the door, when we take off, and anything happens, only us from the inside, we know better what to do with this aircraft to bring, to bring it to the ground safely, to bring all the passengers to the ground. So how to start with this crew to, to recognize you as a leader? It's not as simple as it sounds because leadership is not something you can read in a book. Yeah, you can read all the concepts. You can read uh, uh, books about uh, leadership. Uh, but it's a, it's a soft skill. It's, some, it's non-technical. It's not something you can just repeat, repeat, and then you become better. Yeah, you have to learn a lot from uh, the captain as a, as a first officer first. So you have, you have to learn from the captain and to, to, to take good things because, well, all humans, we are doing mistakes, but you should keep your head cool to realize what is good for you to take it as a, as a knowledge, as a plus for your future career. And then little by little by exercise, you see them happening. And sometimes, sometimes in an aircraft, uh, things goes wrong, go wrong. You have an alert, you have a caution, you have some malfunctions, you have to deal with it. And 
doing this and practicing in the full fly simulator twice per year, each professional pilot will somehow develop a, a stage of leadership. Of course, not all of us are leaders. Not all the people around us are leaders. Some, they have some, maybe some, some personal feature that will make them a, a good leaders. Some of them, they are learning a lot. They read a lot. And by example, they took a lot from other leaders. But not all of them, not all the co-pilots will become captain one day. It's not a shame. Somebody will not take the responsibility of leading a team or taking an aircraft and the passengers lives and the crew with you in your in your shoulders on your shoulders so some co-pilots will never be captains that doesn't make them unprofessional they will be very well trained professional doing their job from the right and seat. so to expand around us they're not only leaders around us but even people that don't think they'll be a good leader someday if they listen if they learn by example, if they took the right example, if they have the right mentor, maybe they will become they will become better leader. They will become leader in, in real life. My recipe is that to present in front of my crew as a crew member first. Of course, they know who I am. Of course, they know I'm experienced. They, they maybe they flew with me before, maybe in a thunderstorm where or in a uh, in a situation where. I, I prove my, my qualities as a leader. But if I start as a crew member, if I talk to everybody in a friendly atmosphere, because I don't have to be their boss. If I'm their boss, if something happens, as Octavian said, in the back of the aircraft, that person there, that cabin crew, he or she will think twice to report it or not. And maybe that piece of information is paramount for me because I have lots of other information in the cockpit but with that information in plus, I will take a better decision. So for me, I, I know in other parts of it, in, in other industries, to accept, and I said that I said that before, to accept feedback, to accept uh, criticism, is not a is not a good thing. But in aviation, to accept feedback, to gain information for your, from your crew, starts with the way you present yourself in front of them. And as, as I said, if I present them, I, I have. I have the authority. They know that I'm a captain. Doesn't mean that I have to, to press them, to show them how strong I am, because this is stupid. They'll be, they'll be respecting me as a boss. If I'm, respect, if I'm presenting myself in front of them as a leader, if you go in a, in a friendly atmosphere, if you work in a friendly atmosphere, optimistic atmosphere you know, to the aircraft, it will be better for me, for my project, for my crew in, in total. Hmm. Yeah, thank, thanks, Emil. And I think, yeah, that's some really important takeaways there. Leadership is not for everyone and that's true in all walks of life. I've come across many people in my career that are extraordinarily good at what they do but really do not enjoy people leadership in the first place uh, and are not really ready for it. They, they, it's not their cup of tea and that's completely okay. They can be a wonderful scientist, a wonderful software engineer, whatever it is that they're good at, accountant, digital marketer, they just prefer not to be a leader of people and it's just not something that they enjoy. I like what you were saying about being very uh, human and very personable and treating people with respect uh, because the, the consequences of doing the opposite uh, in your case, very severe. If if people don't communicate with you because they don't have that level of respect and trust going on, then the consequences could be very severe. So over to you again, Octavian. What do you take from Emil in terms of translating that into the business world? Well, here's a checklist for leaders uh, based on what Emil just said. Number one, um, achieving, making sure that everyone has clarity as to what the mission is. Uh, in aviation, it's clear. The flight is from, let's say, Paris to New York, right? With 200 passengers. The mission is to get them safely and comfortably and on time to New York. That's clear. In businesses, in a small business, it's clear because we're, it's just a, a, a dozen of us. There's a customer. We need to serve the customer and that's it. The bigger the organization, the more complex it does. I have to serve the hierarchy. We have to look at costs. We have to take care of 
customers, but not as much. Let the robots answer and deal with them and things like that. So there has to be clarity about what um, the mission is, number one. Number two, what happens in aviation is that everyone is prepared. Uh, everyone, speaking of training, for instance, one thing that differentiates training in aviation from training in, com in companies is, uh, or three things actually, is that in aviation, training is for everyone. I mean, Emil is a super captain examiner for 18 years. Still, twice a year, he has to report to the simulator, he has to practice, and somebody's checking him if he does that, and he has to take the exam. Nobody says, ah, nobody says, I are an examiner, don't worry about the exams now, we know you're good, Emil, go ahead and fly. No. So training is for everybody. Number one, num uh, one. two, training is on a very wide range of topics, from extinguishing fire to communicating to dealing with aggressive passengers to uh, b boring uh, regulations about including now with pandemic and masks and things like that. And number three, training is repeated. It's going on all the time. It's not just once. Oh, we trained you when you joined our company. We had the induction period. You were sent to three days of training in the first two weeks. That's it. Now go deliver. Uh, in companies, that doesn't happen. And that creates problem down the road. Because when Emil does the briefing, he knows that everyone who's on crew is well prepared. Otherwise, they would not be there. They would not have their qualification. They would not be allowed to be there. So number one, goal clarity. Number two. Uh, good preparation. Number three, uh, clear responsibilities. You have the goal is this. Out of that, you have to do A and B and C. And that if you don't do that, that's trouble. Uh, number four is uh, responsibility for your job, but also for the overall mission. If you see something that yeah, it's not that, say something to someone else. For instance, in a company, what does it mean? It means you walk down the uh, lobby and one light bulb is off. Okay, should you now go get a staircase and fix the bulb? Maybe not, but report it right away to the people in charge of logistics uh, and uh, head office administration and things like that. If you know that um, one customer was unhappy about something, you're an engineer, you went to them to service something, uh, hey, my job was to fix their uh, printer, but they were unhappy about this. Say it to your account manager. Um, because that's, that's what it means to be accountable for, for the whole team. And uh, so any leader um, who wants to have uh, a high level of performance, and not only today, but on a sustainable terms, need to make sure that these things are done. There is goal clarity. People are prepared. They know what their role is, and they do that. They have a big picture. They are ready to help others. Um, that's not always easy to do, but in the end, that's the, that's the goal for a leader. When, when we were especially, when a, when somebody was just a specialist, you had your own thing to worry about. You're an accountant, you're a sales guy. You, it, success was about how good you are. Now success is about how well you put everyone together and achieve a team bigger mission. Yeah, thank you, Octavian, and, and well summarized in terms of the takeaways from that. The final topic I'd like to explore before we get to our rapid round, I promise to come back to this as well, Octavian. You mentioned the great resignation early in our uh, interview today. I'd like a, the very quick fire, because it's a big topic, the very quick fire, short answer of why you think it's happening and what we need to do about it as leaders. So uh, if we zoom out a little bit, let me just say uh, what we all know is that these are huge changes in the workplace, the biggest changes in our generation, working from home, things like that. Now, people can look at it in two ways. Whenever there's a change, oh my God, it's a danger. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, don't, I can't work from home. I don't want to go to the office. Or they can look at it as an opportunity. Uh, what's good about that? Well, I can have my own schedule. In, in 2012, in my work-life balance book, I talked about have a different schedule. Uh, work still work eight, work eight hours a day. That's 40 a week. Uh, but take Mondays off and work on Saturday. Take, take breaks. Some people say, oh, okay, that's crazy. You can do that now, right? So you can think of it as an opportunity. Now, if our listeners um, are not good at what they do and they value comfort too much, they should not resign, right? Uh, but our leaders and our, re our listeners are not like that. If you're good at what you're doing, if you're good at what you're doing, you have an immense power as an employee now. It does not mean you should automatically resign, 
but it should it means that if you've always wanted something more free time bigger salary uh, flexible hours whatever now is the time f- to ask for that so that's message number 1 message number 2 um the world is big and some people graduated from low school in a small town somewhere in a country and say, oh, my chances of being employed by the top legal companies in London or Europe are practically zero. Now they're not zero because with online, the world is flat. You can work if you're good at work, if you're a good lawyer, you can get to work for the best legal companies in the world. So treat your uh, horizon not as ah, my city, maybe 100 miles around it because I can't commute more than no. Treat your expertise as something that can be valuable to people worldwide. Some people who are resigning are resigning for good reasons, meaning um, I can do better. Some other words are resigning because they, uh, uh, they're just fed up uh, and they, don't, they, they think the grass is greener somewhere else. Now, grass is not automatically greener somewhere else. So whatever you want to decide, think twice. Uh, but know that it's, it is a time of opportunity. It is a time where you can have big changes and big gains in the way you work, in the money you make, in the people you work with, in how much time you have for you and your hobbies. But you have to um, um, really analyze what's going on. But the good news is that opportunities are way bigger today than three years ago, let alone 15 years ago. Yeah, the world has changed forever. Octavian and COVID-19 has had detrimental effects on the world, but it also opened our eyes to what was possible around things like virtual work and work from home. And we are not going to fully go back to the way things previously were. And that does present an opportunity for many. Yeah, nicely summarized. Let me just give a, a quick example. Today I had a call with a very good friend of mine, an Australian who's been living and working in Malaysia for the last 17 years. Yeah. What has he decided? To move back to Australia, to Perth. Same time zone, right. continue working, but from the place that he loves most. He would like With to his live. wife and with the friends there he's always go. had. Five years ago, ah, maybe not as easy decision, mm. but now totally doable. Yeah, and I think a lot of uh, managers and executives that were previously nervous about it have also realized that the experiment that was forced upon us by COVID-19 was much more successful than we thought it would be, I think would be the, the answer to that. All right. Well, thank you uh, both uh, gentlemen. I'd like to go into our rapid fire round now. Just a few questions for you as we, as we wrap up. So my first one, and Emil, we'll start with you. What's the one thing that you know now that you wish you knew when you were 20? <laughs> when I, I was uh, listening to your previous uh, podcasts, I was afraid about this question because I'm normally I'm very frank and honest, you know. So um, I, I I wish I knew that uh, the personal experience and the personal. Um, things which makes your life better are more important than uh, fortune or money or whatever what I was uh, chasing when I was uh, 20. Because my life uh, became much better when I was uh, focusing on what really matters to me, meaning uh, love, family, children, friends. Uh, before, I was uh, like a robot doing uh, flights a lot I was flying a lot I was away a lot for uh, different places in the world for training centers checking and uh, training pilots uh, all the way all the time away from home so I wish I was I knew that uh, it's better for my life for my uh, even for my career because as, um, as as soon as I took this workload out of my shoulders uh, this way of thinking uh, my life become uh, become became better. Mm. Thank you for sharing that, and that's something that I've come to realize over time as well. And I wish I knew it earlier for sure. How about you, Octavian? I would have um, developed my communication and presentation skills even more uh, early on, because I think we can all agree that a lot is about how you relate to others, um, um, ask questions rather than talk all the time 
make your point clearly. And many ideas in companies die, not because they're bad ideas, they might be good ideas, but because they're presented poorly, either with too many details or with so much flaring passion that people think is just a, 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 a something that will disappear tomorrow or with, without a focus on the people you speak to and all the focus is on what the project means for me and what it will do to me. So uh, this importance, the very high importance of understanding who you're dealing with and uh, trying to help them achieve what they want in a good way. Uh, and if you do that, uh, things will be okay for you. They meaning your boss, your customer, your friends, whoever. Yeah, leadership is 100% about how you relate to other human beings. I like what you're saying there about taking the time to understand them. And I like that you're picking up that a big subset of that is your ability to communicate with people. So thank you for sharing that as well, Octavian. Uh, next one, uh, what is your favorite quote? And let's start with you this time, Octavian. You choose your life. It's a, of course, we live in a world where, where many things going on outside of us, on top of our head, like the pandemic, for instance, and uh, I happen to believe in God. Um, uh, that, uh, but still, in any situation you are, you have choices. Uh, and where, you, where we are now is, to a very large extent, the result of the choices that we made. For instance, let's say uh, I lost a match, whatever sport that may be. The guy beat me. Yeah, well, that's one way to look at it. But one other way to look at it is that I was not well prepared. I did not train enough. I did not study enough. So of course I could blame the other guy and hope that sometime I'll meet someone poorer than that guy. Or I can focus on what I can do, work on that and increase my chances next time. So we even had that on. So we made some jackets for the team some years back. You choose your life. Very nice, uh, nice uh, way of putting it as well. And for you, Emil, what's your favorite quote? Um, I don't think I have one now, because, but because I had so many in my life. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a passionate reader, and every time I read a book, I took some of the ideas there, and um, they, for the moment, seem to, to guide uh, my existence for a short period of time. But uh, I have a military background, and the one I kept for my, as a quote for most of my life, not now, and let's say it's a, it's a Latin one. It's audaces fortuna juva, meaning that the luck or the god of uh, luck, fortune, fortuna, uh, is uh, uh, helping the, the bold ones, the one they, they dare to become something or to do something more. Uh, meaning that if you're sitting, uh, you're not doing nothing, you're not thinking anything, we're just uh, comfy at your environment, um, you cannot comply about being unfortunate, you know? You cannot comply about uh, uh, misfortune if you're not doing anything, if you don't dare go out of your, uh, of your let's say, warmly cozy environment. That's a great message, Emil, and resonates very uh, deeply with me at the chapter of my life that I'm at. So thank you so much for sharing that. That meant something to me, and I'm sure it'll mean something to the audience as well. And finally, and Octavian, we'll, we'll get you to close us out here. Um, I'm sure that there's going to be people in our audience that are very interested in the messages from today, uh, whether it be getting a copy of Dark Cockpit or getting in contact with the two of you to no more. How do people find you? Well, uh, the easiest is um, if uh, find us if you want to find us, find us on LinkedIn. We have uh, uh, names, the Brovolsky, and then this is the Emil is showing a copy of the Dark Cockpit. Go to the website darkcockpitbook.com. No dashes, no lines, no nothing. Darkcockpitbook.com. You can download a free chapter. It's the chapter titled. A New Crew Every Day, by the way. It's a very interesting chapter. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to submit card details or whatever. Just download the chapter and enjoy it. Of course, books. the book is found on Amazon as Kindle or as a paper-based paperback. And we look forward to hearing from as many of you as possible. Reach out to us. Of course, you can leave us a message on Dark Cockpit Book, but also feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn. We regularly post there articles, different things. So 
uh, we look forward to staying in touch. Fantastic. Thank you, Octavian. And I will we'll quickly add to that before we close out that we will run a competition here at the Leadership Project. So listen up, everyone. If you took something out of today's uh, episode and you share it on social media, so LinkedIn or Facebook, and you tag the Leadership Project and go ahead and tag Emil and Octavian as well and share with us what your greatest learning was from today's episode, one lucky winner will win a copy of uh, Dark Cockpit. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time today, uh, uh, dialing in uh, in your evening. I really appreciate uh, your time with us today. I know that the audience is going to really be thinking now about how they apply what you've shared with us today into their leadership style and into their workplaces. So thank you so much for bringing such great value and being open with us today. Thank you, Mick, for the invitation. All the best to everyone. All right. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you for listening to the Leadership Project podcast at mixspears.com. I'm your host, Mick Spears. Sound design and editing by Faris Sadek. Social media by Gerald Calibo. And special thanks to our operations manager, Say Spears. We appreciate you and we appreciate your time today. You can catch the video podcast and our series of shorter videos by subscribing to the Leadership Project YouTube channel. And you can join the conversation at our Facebook community group. We look forward to bringing you another great interview next week as we learn together and lead together. In the meantime, please do take care, look out for each other, and always remember to challenge the status quo.